Most people with more than five years at work have gone through at least one wave of change, small or big. When this change is on the verge of being unsuccessful, they will call a person to be responsible for change management, who will implement a bunch of tools and processes to kind of engage with people towards the change that is uh, required. Five years after my first job, I was what the person who was responsible for change management. And there, there was someone, I, I think it was like a person in human resources who told me, you gotta do a car. And of course, every time that I'm, I don't understand something, I tend to crack a joke and then I say, yeah, but it's not because I'm brown that my name should be at car. I didn't know anything about that. So my, I say, my name is Ivan basically. Um, so, but just to put it in context, not knowing what is at car in change management is like being a geek and not knowing Star Wars, or it's like being a consultant at Accenture and not doing awesome PowerPoints. And today <clears throat> I have the chance to have someone who has been for so many years working with, with and doing research for, um, for the company behind Adcar, that the company is called Prosci, Prosci. And by the way, back then in the years where I didn't know anything about change management, I was calling it Prosci because it sounds a little bit Italian and I didn't know anything about it. So today my guest is Tim Creasy, which is the Chief Innovation Officer for Prosci. Mm -hmm. Now I say it correctly. He's a change expert. He has been doing quite a lot of re research and he is the co-author of the book, Change Management, The People's Side of Business. Welcome team. I'm, I'm super happy to have you uh, with me today. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And our company name has been mispronounced numerous different ways over the years. Uh, we've been called Prosky a number of times, so <laughs> Prosty. Uh, it's actually interesting. The founder researched how to name your company before he named it. Uh, and come to find out if people mispronounce your name, they're more likely to remember it going forward. You think about Pepsi and some of these. So it's not a name. You just know how to pronounce the first time you see it. So the name of the company actually comes from a contraction of professional and science. So it's pro-sci, uh, using research to understand the variables of more successful change. So yeah, and thank you for being here uh, and for having me. Thank you, Tim. I, I saw a posting of you in LinkedIn that, that you made like two years ago with a picture of you, your first day, day at ProSci, 22 years ago, I would guess. Um, you really had this kind of engineering look, freshly out of economics and political science studies. I want to know, what was the reason you chose that journey of sticking out with ProSci for so many years? Yeah, it's a fascinating journey, right? And the post that you referenced, I believe I put it up on my 20 year anniversary, uh, which was January 30th, 2021. So January 30th, 2001, I started my, my journey at ProSci. The fascinating thing is I got hired for a three month project. Mm -hmm. That's all the more I was hired for, yeah. Uh, I had just come out of undergrad. Uh, ProSci was about nine people uh, with a big heavy focus on business process reengineering change management was actually a side part of the business at that point. And I got brought in for a three month project to research with a number of people who had taken our training program, what kind of support they wanted afterwards. Uh, and I jumped right in, did some pretty interesting analysis, synthesis, uh, started a journey of pattern spotting and communicating insights that were extracted from that research in a way that Jeff Hyatt, the founder said, well, why don't you stick around a little bit longer? Uh, and that was the beginning of the journey. So um, yeah, I've, it's been an amazing journey to watch ProSci as an organization evolve because when we were founded, you know, we were founded by this engineer, insatiably curious engineer that wanted to know why some projects succeeded and others didn't. Mm. I mean, that's the fundamental question. Why do the ones that work do and the ones that don't, don't? Uh, and what can we do to better understand the variables that enable successful change and unsuccessful change? But when Jeff founded the company, he wanted to be a product-oriented business uh, because he had been doing really tough consulting work on the side to stand up ProSci as a company. 
And if you're a product company, you're not constrained by 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year, right? Because hours constrain us when we step into services, but they don't. And so he envisioned ProSci bringing value to its customers through books and binders. It was those research journals and toolkits that would help people operationalize a more structured approach to, at the time, business process reengineering, project planning, business case analysis, and change management. So initially envisioned as a product company building books and binders, which, which makes you develop stuff in a particular way. Right, Because if I'm not charging you hourly to explain it to you, to conduct the assessment, to collect the data, I put a lot more energy into making the content immediately accessible to the people that bring it to life. About two years later, though, 2003, people keep saying, will you come train us on this? Will you come train us on this? Will you come train us on this? And so we, uh, I kept pushing on Jeff and I said, we got to build training. And he said, here's the thing. We're not gonna build a three-day training program. We're gonna build a three-day transformational experience that helps people feel like they can tackle change in a way they never knew they could before by understanding the dynamics and the moving parts of how people change within an organization. So that was his bar of success. Not three days of lecture and PowerPoint, a three-day transformational experience where people feel emboldened to tackle change in a new way. And as a business, so we stood that up. That's that cornerstone program. The very first year, we taught four open, and pro, open enrollment programs all year, one a quarter. Uh, the next year, we got up to about eight. We thought we were doing good. Today, there's probably 25 this week being taught around the planet. Uh, and so that's kind of the scale of growth on the training side. About 2014, 15, we embarked on a journey that we called internally T to R transactional to relational. Ooh. So we were delivering mind blowing three day experiences, right? I mean, the, the NPS scores were almost embarrassing, right? The number of times people left the program and said, that was the best training program I've ever taken in my life. But we counted that per program. That was the actual metric is how many of those comments did you get each program? shooting for like, you know, at least a third, half the class. And we were hitting that mark, but it was still bound within starts on Tuesday. Well, Monday night's the meet and greet Tuesday morning. It starts Wednesday night is karaoke, which is part of the allure of the program. Thursday, we finish up. Everybody heads out Thursday afternoon. And that's the end of this mind blowing experience, but it's time bound. We said, that's still a transaction. How do we move into becoming more relational with our clients? How do we embody the behaviors that we want to come alongside them rather than teach them and send them on their way? And so that's been this fascinating journey. And so you, you mentioned this picture of me as this two month, you know, three weeks out of undergrad stepping into a three month gig. And at the under end of this right now, and you might've seen it in the news in the last month or two, ProSci extended into Europe. So now we have a presence in South America, Australia, Europe, Asia. Um, it's a fascinating journey, right? To watch the people side of change and our ability to bring value to the agents of change uh, really expand and grow over the years. But back then, <clears throat> was it, more the purpose of the company that made you stay or was it more like the science behind because you had this look of people of the person who likes digging and doing research so so funny thing when i took that three-month gig um i was going to be done in 18 months uh, because i did a i did my undergrad in economics and political science and i managed to get out of the uh, the double major within three and a half years. Um, my girlfriend at the time, now partner in life, was doing a teaching degree. So she had to do an extra year of school to do uh, student teaching. I was lined up to go do a PhD in comparative economics and teach economics. That was the plan. I wanted to be a professor teaching comparative economics. So the plan was not where I ended up today. And here's what made me stick around. The two things. Um, economics and political science, what I loved about each of them is they help us understand what makes people do what they do. Mm. 
they give us lenses to understand human behavior, human motivation, human decision, whether it's the political, you know, or the economic lens, both of them just get us a better understanding of, of human nature. And when I started to explore change management, the discipline of change management, I began calling it micro microeconomics. Huh. So if macroeconomics is how the whole economy of, of the country works and microeconomics is how a firm makes and takes decisions about what to do, micro microeconomics is how does Yvonne decide to do what to do? How does he decide to either invest his time there or there? Uh, what makes him lean into this change or lean back from this change? And so the notion that in the end, it's a, at the kernel, what makes people do what they do? And it turns out, as we started to get exposed to this discipline of change management, there was a bunch, or as I did, uh, there was a bunch of organizational change where the human beings were not being treated like the most valuable asset that we said that they were, right? We, we call our people the most valuable asset. We talk about how they're so, so critical to the success of the organization. But then when it comes to, to try to bring a change about, we send an email to people on Monday for training on Tuesday for go live on Wednesday. Exactly. exactly. That, that's not the way you treat your most valuable asset, right? And I was actually, I was delivering a, it was a presentation at a Gartner conference in Washington, D.C. years ago. And I was really, I, you know, when you get on stage and you're just really in the groove, you got the whole audience right there with you. It was one of those moments. And I had this really fun slide where I animate email on Monday for training on Tuesday for go live on Wednesday as the opposite of good change management, right? That's the opposite of preparing your people, the opposite of equipping your people, the opposite of supporting your people through change. And so I have that slide building, about 300 people in the room, and a woman up front raises her hand. And I'm like, that's a pretty bold move in a room of 300 people. I'm up here on a riser, to, you know, when I got everybody dialed in. So I stopped and I said, oh, oh, you know, what, what, what's, what's your observation? And she said, at my company, we send an email on Monday for training on Tuesday for go live last Thursday. <laughs> the system we turned on last week, we finally start telling people about, right? That's not the way to treat our most valuable asset if we want changes to be successful. So if we have an understanding of the human being as the unit, the node of change, micro microeconomics, and we realize that organizational change depends on how well we help our people forward and through that, then there's opportunity for us to learn and build structure and direction to help organizations, projects, and people be, be better off. So. This is kind of the journey at ProSci, fueled by research, but then turned into actionable, accessible training programs, tools, licensable solutions inside of organizations. Uh, uh, <clears throat> talking about research, um, there is a lot of changes that has happened since, I don't know, since the time you started the, uh, working in ProSci in terms of um, what is acceptable in the, in the workplace. So I remember in my early days at, uh, at work, certain things were more acceptable, these inside jokes, a little bit of, uh, of cracking jokes about women or about certain minorities, it was, or being yelled by you, you, your boss. That was kind of acceptable. This is the way people learn. That, that's what I, what I told. Or if you didn't show... Uh, it, uh, I, I think the interesting thing, though, is it was only accessible by the people in power that weren't on the other end of those jokes. Uh, and, and, and so to me, I think there's a the notion of as a leader, I think our every leader has a role yeah. of creating a condition. It's condition creating, right? Condition setting. Yeah. That's each of our jobs is to condition set so that the people who make up our organization can achieve the most for themselves and for the organization. Mm. Now, if a person has to walk through the door and into an environment where they don't actually feel comfortable, because even though it's the, just the way it is here that we tell these jokes, that person still sits there and either has to leave part of them at the door or try to bury part of them or just sit there and grin and bear it. Then I actually think, um, it's a distorted view of that it was okay. It, 
just seemed okay because we hadn't started to perspective take and understand what that condition, what that environment must actually feel like from all of the folks who are part of the environment rather than just the folks who are casting uh, the tone of the environment. So you're right. It is conditioning. So major changes have, have happened in terms of change management in, uh, during the last 20 years. What have you noticed in terms of research, in terms of the perception from employees on what is allowed or not, uh, in terms of how do we manage change? Uh, what has been the kind of the evolution of the model that you are ap applying in, uh, at Prosai? Yeah, great question. And I think this uh, the evolution of the discipline of change management goes right alongside that, right? That um, there was this, you know, back in the day in those consulting companies that made really nice slides, early 90s, yes. change management services, CMS, was sometimes equated to, and I am not okay with the language here, but chicks making slides. It was a pejorative, it was a degrading the no notion that change management was only building nice slides and it was just something that a small group of junior employees did. Then you see this evolution into change management is just communication and training. Oh, mm -hmm. we do change management. We build communication plans and training plans. But then we tried to keep evolving it to say communication and training are nice. Good change management is providing your people with what they need to be successful on the changes that you're asking them to take. And then I think the last three years did something fascinating in terms of this evolution of what we know about change and change management. Because I, I, one of my keynotes I do a lot is about the future of change and work. And a couple of the conditions that I talk about there are um, the involuntary digital transformation, right? Yeah. CTOs, CIOs were talking about digital transformation for so long. And they were installing digital capabilities, a bunch of zeros and ones, but they hadn't actually translated those digital capabilities into the fabric of who we are and how we work. Um, so you get that digital transformation, you get an instantaneous work from home experiment. Hmm. Instantaneous work from home experiment, right? Where people in a matter of one, two, three, four days, we saw tremendous amounts of work that was done on premises move to off premises that we never actually knew could have been done off, off premises. And then we get this fascinating notion that the people side of the organization and the people side of change can no longer be unseen. Hmm. And then play this out for me. Do you remember it was about 2017, there was a YouTube video, it was a BBC broadcaster and he was at home and he was delivering a news channel, a uh, news, and then the door opened, remember this? Yeah, yeah. And, and a toddler. And the toddler comes in, yeah, the toddler comes in, and then I watched it recently, and there's even a younger child that comes in on a little scooter, and then the partner comes crawling in and wrestling them back out, right, uh, and mortified, and this thing goes viral, because the notion of seeing somebody's kid in the background of a professional setting was absurd, but then we all go through the last three years. We have to look into the living rooms and dining rooms of our colleagues during project meetings, right? We hear the symphony of their lives as the backdrop to any conversation we're having about work. I call this sort of a paradoxical infusion of humanity uh, into the organization, right? It, we thought when we went 2D, there would be this vacuum sucking sound of human, human connection. But the reality is you can't not see people as human beings after this experience, this individual and collective experience that we went through together. So my first biggest change in the what's changed in change management is that the human side of the organization, the people side of change can't be unseen. There is a collective awareness that people adopting solutions is crucial and central to achieving change outcomes. And I think that's kind of this shift that's been going on for a while. I use the example, my grandfather's GE. Uh, right? He worked there his whole life, started there, finished there. When he was told to jump, what was his answer? How high, right? I mean, that was the value system back then. Those are the values that were reinforced. Today's value system is much different. You know, when we ask our employees to jump, it's why? Why should I jump? And do you understand all the other stuff I've got going on? 
so this the the human being as being you can't unsee it after what we went through i think that's one of the first big changes we also did some research just recently around what are those i like describing change success as sort of an algebra equation Ooh. right there's different variables that contribute to a successful change uh and we asked the question for future change given what we all just went through and what we have on the horizon, what are those variables that are gonna be most important? What, what variables are emerging and getting more important in this new organizational landscape we're in front of? And do you want, you want me to tell you what some of those were? Uh, absolutely, Tim. I, I, I'm really um, interested about that one. <laughs> so I've got the top 10 list. I'll, I'll go quickly through the top 10 list and then we can circle back to the ones you're interested in. Number one is involvement and engagement. The top variable to successful change in the future is how we better involve and engage our people. Number two is communication ad adaptations. So how do we adapt more crisp, clear, concise, effective communications? Number three is evolutions in the discipline of change management. Uh, more adaptive, more iterative, more right fit for scale. Uh, number four was flexibility and agility that organizations need to intentionally build change muscle uh, into the organization. Number five was around, of course, digital and technology, all of the change associated with this digital transformation that's finally bringing to life transformation out of the digital capabilities we spent so much time installing. The sixth is the hybrid workplace. So how do we reimagine that workplace of the future that has both on and on off premises. Number seven is leadership and leadership showing up in a whole new way in terms of connection to the organization, to strategy, to people. Number eight is collaboration and connection. Hmm. Again, elevating the importance of bringing the right people around the table at the right time to solve our problems or seize the opportunities we have in front of us. Number nine is success definition and measurement. So are we chasing aspirations or do we have a clear articulation definition of success that's been cascaded and is backed by data, is measurable, that lets us know if we're achieving the outcomes of the changes we're setting into? One quick uh, little side note there. We just completed another research effort, which is our kind of 25 year anniversary of that big biennial benchmarking study and defining change success was the deep dive topic that we really dove into. So we've got a whole new set of data and insight around defining change success and how critical and how to execute it. But, and then my number 10 on the list was portfolio and saturation. So how do we more effectively manage numerous changes going on to re reduce the collision uh, and increase the coherence of the changes happening in the organization? Uh, Tim, I, I want to stay, I was astonished to see leadership uh, number seven, number seven, because I was expecting to see it a little bit higher up. Uh, yeah. The reason is that, I mean, Remember that I started with the story that somebody in a chart told me, this is a car, find your way. And I still think about this opportunity, my first opportunity to deal with change. And by the way, it failed. Uh, of course, nobody made me pay anything. Nobody noticed that it failed. I noticed that it failed because I was seeing the level of engagement in the organization towards this. It wasn't like a big change, but it, it was a failure. And then I have been thinking quite a lot about that and then understood that it was mainly because of this um, element where leadership was doing things that were different than what the rest of the organization were doing. So, I mean, I, in, from one side, you can say, oh, the ad car model didn't work. But from the other side, you can say the way we understand, or we can interpret because I didn't have all the... Oh, I wasn't trained for that. I just had the principles, which I found it quite interesting, but, and I didn't know how to apply it. So leadership for me, number seven, what the hell? Yeah, let me give you an answer to that because, so in this study, the first part of the study was there are seven top contributors to success that have been established over two decades of research. Yeah. You know what number one is on that list? Active and visible sponsorship by your leaders. 
Yes. So you're exactly right. Leadership by a very significant margin already shows up at the top of our, what we call those seven top contributors to success. Um, then after what was really neat in the study is we took those seven top contributors, active and visible sponsorship, effective communication, people manager engagement, employee engagement, a structured change management approach, dedicated change management resources, and the integration of the technical and people sides. And we said for all seven of those contributors, what are the unique challenges in this post-pandemic world? What are the challenges to sponsorship in a post-pandemic world? What are the challenges to communication in this post-pandemic world? What are the challenges to resource allocation, change management in this post-pandemic world? We also asked what adaptations did you make to each of the seven? So for those top seven, we have this whole table of what are the challenges and adaptations to bring those tactics to life more effectively. Then at the end of that, we said, what other contributors to success do you see emerging and growing in importance over time? And that's where this top 10 list came from. So I, what, I, what I'm assuming is... If I throw them all in the same pot, absolutely. Senior leaders being that active and visible participant, building coalitions of support, communicating directly. You may not have come across, that's another acronym from the ProSci uh, universe, ABCs of sponsorship. No. Right? Came funny. right out. Another one, right? And this is kind of what's, it's a neat example of research turning into actionable insights. Yeah. So over the years, we asked, what are the most important activities of your senior leaders in times of change to sponsor that change effectively in the organization? What do the senior leaders really need to be doing? <clears throat> and what fell out was the acronym ABC, active and visible participation throughout the project. <laughs> that if your senior leader shows up at the kickoff and disappears as if a magician, you know, made them vanish, that sends an incredibly strong message to the organization about whether or not this change matters, right? So active and visible participation throughout, build coalitions of support. That's the second, that's the B. It's the notion that for a change to come to life in the organization, and especially a strategic, important change, there's a whole host of leaders throughout the organization that need to sponsor this change in, into their part of, part of the organization. Those folks are that coalition and the health, maintaining a healthy coalition, building a strong and maintaining a healthy coalition, one of the most significant indicators of success or failure for the change. So active and visible participation, build a coalition. The C is communicate directly to employees. That in times of change, our senior leaders are the preferred sender, the voice of change. And what we find in the research is it's specific messages. Why? Why now? What if we don't? Hmm. Yes. And I'm in, in today's world, I'm adding why this instead of that. Because our organizations, we have so much going on, uh, the ability to decide where to put our focus, where to put our priority, where to put our energy is critical. So active and visible participation, build a coalition, communicate directly, why, why now, what if we don't, why this instead of that. That's what our sponsors need to do if they want to line up the project towards successful change by fulfilling their role as a sponsor. Tim. It's not signing checks and charters, right? Exactly. Um, Tim, you, you have mentioned this notion of, of, of um, building the muscle, especially to have the mental capacity in times of change where we are a little bit worried about the change, there is uncertainty, we don't know how to manage, like the change that we had during COVID, it's changing our way, uh, the way we work. Um, the, the development of meta skills for in the organization hasn't been that big pre-COVID. During COVID, it has started, but then I have noticed that now that they're, that they're kind of forgetting. So my question is, it's a little bit provocative to say, but does the failure in change comes from the fact that we don't have the right tools in order to train people? Because training three, four days is over. It's, it's like, we don't need to watch any more slides. I want to learn a new thing. I go to YouTube and I learn it in a TED talk or for 15 minutes or sometimes even in, in an animation in five, in five minutes. Today, I, I don't do any more e-learnings. I, I, I read less books, which is unfortunate. Um, 
But uh, so the, the way people learn has changed the, the practice of meta skills, like a little bit more of resilience, a little bit better communication, not in terms of the structure of communication, but how to really to be a little bit more uh, engage the audience in its practice. And unfortunately, I have the, the, the impression that the training industry is like still the same for the last 20 years. There has been some my, minor changes. There is a little bit of tech startups trying to, but I mean, during COVID, the only thing that grew was e-learnings, which is kind of boring still because we don't finish an e-learning. If you take a six hours e-learning, only 11, 12% of people will finish it. So is that the problem that we don't know how to teach human beings? I, I, you know, I think I'm not going to kind of look into a crystal ball like this, uh, but I do think that there's this fascinating, I've been talking about it kind of like a mountain. Yeah. This notion of digital digitalization and what digital transformation actually can do in terms of the behaviors and, and the way it can change the way we we show up. Um, the front end of the hill is about getting stuff digitalized, right? Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time getting stuff into a digital format. But then the other side of the hill, I think, is now that it's been digitalized, what can we do with it? There's so many oh, home and, oh, so many different things we can do now that it's in a different format for to be consumed in different ways. And so, yeah, I think a part of what you're describing is the actual changes in how we interact and engage and learn that are now available to us because this di digital transformation really sunk into the, into the fabric of who we are. Um, uh, there's a parallel that we coach a number of our organizations and clients through right now in terms of this, when we talk about designing the workplace of the future. Mm. One of the way the conversations I'll take leaders down is uh, over the last three years, your organization and the people in your organization built a whole bunch of new capabilities, yeah. right? Whether they wanted to or not, they built yeah. capabilities around digital transformation, flexibility, communication, collaboration. The workplace of the future needs to be able to leverage those and take into account and accommodate for those, those new capabilities, right? Uh, at the same time, over the last three years, each of us, developed a number of new expectations about what work is going to be, what's our relationship to work, what's our relationship to place. The workplace of the future, the leaders of the future will need to effectively incorporate those new expectations as well. So, and I think there's this parallel to learning, right? Uh, learning of the future needs to figure out how to incorporate and accommodate the new capabilities, new expectations, new modalities, new ways that we go about consuming the information around us. So fascinating space. Now, I, I still want to stay a little bit in the area of leadership because I yeah, think yeah. it hasn't been discussed enough, the role that leaders have in times of change. Uh, in the work and the experience that you have gained working with so many companies, what are the major misconceptions about change that uh, that m makes leaders in organizations take bad decisions? Yeah, and there's a number of these misconceptions that we can kind of explore. Um, the very first one I would put out there as a misconception would be, can't I just tell my people to do it? Exactly. They're paid for it. <laughs> yeah, this, they're paid to do their job. Can't I just tell them to change how they do their job? And so I think that's this first misconception, this lack of acknowledgement or understanding of how important that people side of change is and that uh, you have a role and responsibility to help people through. Uh, there's kind of an interesting offshoot of that misconception, the notion of malicious compliance. Malicious compliance. So if a leader, I think I can just tell people to do it and I don't actually get them engaged in understanding why and what we're trying to achieve. And there's a visual I used to use for this in my presentations. It was, imagine a country road out in the country and they're painting road lines down the middle. And that painted road line is going down the middle and then it goes right over a dead animal and continues going on the other side. That's malicious compliance, right? I painted the line. You told me you wanted the line painted. I painted you the line. I didn't remove the obstacle and do it as do it well. 
I just kind of did what you said to do. So I can, ju I can just tell people to do it is one of those myths that leaders have uh, and malicious compliance is often what we see on the other side. Uh, here's another one of those major misconceptions. If I don't know the whole answer, I can't tell anybody about any of it yet. Hmm. Like this notion that as a leader, it's a vulnerable state to put forward any information, especially if that information might change. Um, now, I think the pandemic addressed a good bit of that. Uh, that notion of needing to be completely certain before sharing any information. Yeah, I talk about one of my uh, conditions of the future and work and change I talk about is the notion of shifting success horizons. So March, let's say uh, June 2019, our success horizon might be five years out. That's how far we're looking. June of 2020, it was five days or five hours out, right? Like, how, what are we even going to do to get through this week? How are we going to, now I think it's lifted up a bit. You know, we might be out in that five quarter range, but that shifting time horizon, that notion that we had to adapt and adjust by necessity in that initial pandemic response, that's one of those capabilities that the crisis, I think, helped, helped bring. And it helped us address this myth that if I don't know the whole answer, I can't tell anybody about it. My next myth is an interesting one. This one might get a little controversial too, that simply involving people in the solution or in experimentation is enough. Like we don't cha need change management if we just get people involved in designing the solution. Uh, and like half of that is correct. Getting people involved in designing the solution is better than designing it without them. But getting them involved being enough for them to successfully navigate what it means to bring that change to life, that, I mean, come on, that's, that, that's, that's a misconception, right, uh, that exists in particularly in, in some of these more um, kind of novel change management approaches, right? Uh, just get them experimenting with us, that's enough. Uh, no, no, no. It's better than not, but it's not enough. I, I, I have even seen that in companies who are in the tech industry where they're heavily used heavy users of design thinking, only involving people into the solution part. What is, like, yeah. is the principle of design thinking? I've seen it also in big corporations trying to embrace the, the principle of lean startup. Yep. Thinking about the solutions, but and doing a lot of experimentation, but not discussing what are the challenges of the, the company. That you need to Absolutely. be a wise person to do it, right? And, and it's a false force, it's a forced false dichotomy to say it's either either we're going to experiment, iterate, and learn, or we're going to bring structure to how we bring people through the change process. Like those two things can exist and live in harmony. One other one that's kind of similar to this is if we just build intuitive solutions, we don't need any change management. Right. And and this right here is one of the biggest uh, right here. This yeah. is one of the biggest culprits because oh, we're just going to build solutions so intuitive like an iPhone that people will just know exactly how to use that new order entry system, that new HR benefits portal, whatever the change might be. Is intuitive better than not intuitive? Uh-huh, absolutely. Is it enough to help our people effectively step out of their current state the way they do things today, navigate a bumpy, unknown transition, and arrive effectively and safely at a future state the way we want them to be doing their jobs? No, no, no. Just because it's intuitive is not enough to support that transition. And then I think my last one that I'd offer up in terms of misconceptions is that, I'll give you two more. Uh, the second to last would be, and then remember, this is a misconception at the leader level. Yep. If I have somebody assigned to do change management, I've done my job. And usually it would be human resources, by the way. Yeah, it's an abdication of that role. Yeah, to the HR business partner, maybe to a consultant on the team, maybe to the project lead. But the notion of once I have somebody who has the job title or the name or the task of change management, my job is done as a senior leader. Um, and again, we kind of talked about that already, that sponsoring change is more than signing checks and signing charters. Sponsoring change is about effectively supporting and catalyzing the support for the change throughout the organization. And then I think my last uh, misconception I'd, I'd offer up is that change management equals change control. 
Uh, and the other side of this would be, Tim, you can't manage change. It's organic and it's just going to kind of happen. And uh, people are, you know, that it's a little too fluid. Um, and I get that. I get the notion because I, I do think human beings, the richness of human beings is what brings the unpredictability to all of this stuff, you know, uh, that we are such this rich, unique, diverse group. Um, but change management isn't about trying to control the change. It's about helping people, helping put people on a path to be successful in bringing the change to life. And there are absolutely things that we can do that will increase the likelihood of us, of us getting those results and, and then being successful. I'll often use the analogy, um, are you a Marvel fan by chance? Uh, not really. That's okay. There's a, I'll tell you, there's a character named Dr. Strange and he can control time. Yeah. Okay. So people say change management, oh, they equate it to change control. And the analogy I use is like time management. Like, can you control time? No, not unless you're Dr. Strange, can you control time? But can you manage time more effectively with better intent to make it more effective? Absolutely. So you can't control change for people in the organization, but you can apply the discipline change management to help increase the likelihood they have the answers they need when they need them uh, and that the project can move forward uh, toward what it's trying to achieve. <laughs> I love the example about Marvel. I mean, we can see the difference of culture, the American culture and the European culture, but anyways, Tim, I, I, very often um, I hear senior managers talking about that it is easier to do change in a startup that versus an established corporation. So we, because we often hear that the, the best story is like uh, the transformation of Zappos of in, in order to, to deliver happiness and, and to be more, to bring more value to customers. We hear that Google, for instance, had, had it easier to establish uh, uh, time in order that is devoted in order to be more creative, a specific day to work on things that we are interested in. We, and so most of the good, beautiful stories come from uh, tech startups. Uh, what would it take, in fact, to establish co corporations to, one, break the belief and start believing that change is possible at, uh, in any corporation? Yeah, great question. I do think, you know, that there are some certain advantages that the startup has when it comes to bringing about change, uh, you know, energy, uh, an appetite for experimentation. Often you get more clarity and alignment around uh, a singular purpose, something that people can anchor to. Um, there are certainly going to be challenges though, right, in terms of bringing about meaningful, sustainable change in the startup. Uh challenges maintaining focus, uh, the shiny object syndrome, right? Where it gets easy to chase whatever next thing gets exciting. Uh, and then sort of resource scarcity in terms of the ability to think about scaling that solution. So I, startups, you can bring about change and you're right. You get these novel stories yeah. because when you take a thousand chances with something little tiny, uh, one of those thousand hits, that's a really exciting story. Uh, more established organizations, certainly, you have some challenges around bringing about change, right? Uh, you have just the institutional inertia uh, that you that the change might have to either butt up against or figure out how to kind of uh, align into. And maybe that's one of the most interesting things is it's how does that the change initiative, you know, how much inertia in the culture, values, direction of the organization is this change needing to uh, to take into account or to take account of. Um, but you do, I think, in, in larger organizations, you have resources available uh, to create uh, access, uh, to create the change, to invest in putting time and energy into change. Um, and the ability to drive more large change at scale. I mean, I think Microsoft today is a fascinating example of a large organization doing some fascinating things in terms of driving really meaningful change. Um, 
I know, I know from personal work experience, you know, that they are leaders in the accessibility uh, movements to ensure that all people have access to the information that will help them do their jobs better. And uh, what they're leaning into some of the, you know, uh, safe energy and some of these different solutions that we're starting to see out there. So I think there are many examples of those big organizations that over time with a clearly articulated purpose and leaders who understand why, why now, what if we don't, who step into those roles, you can see change at, an, at, a, at a larger organization. But I remember my uh, one of my uncles was describing, he was describing political change here in the United States. And he described it as, you know, a ferry that moves cars on water. So a big, big boat uh, with a very little tiny rudder. The notion that, you know, you can have a large set of mass moving in a particular direction, and it's pretty hard to move that with a little tiny rudder. But uh, there are certainly examples of large corporations implementing great change and also examples of small institutions having a hard time uh, bringing about meaningful change themselves. Do, do you feel like <clears throat> this inertia that you, you were describing just before, it, it is, uh, does it more, more often come from the top or does it, this inertia is more towards the bottom of the organization? Um, I don't, I, I think you'll find it anywhere. I think you can find it throughout the organization. Um, I think it's an interesting phenomenon to even run into today. Well, not, I mean, of course we're gonna have inertia. But I, I've asked some folks these questions, right? Think about these questions against the backdrop of inertia. Um, how many things did your organization do since February 2020 that they would have told you were impossible in January 2020? Yeah. I mean, ProSci, right? I told you about our three-day cornerstone program. That was only taught in person. We never had taught a virtual instructor-led version of that program because we had flip charts all over the walls. We did treasure hunts, the aforementioned karaoke, right? Um, we had never done a three-day virtual program prior to the pandemic. We would have told you it was impossible. And then we figured out how to do it afterwards. So you had this fascinating, you know, what did you do What that was impossible? You could have, you, you would have articulated was uh, something you could have never done before, right? That's a fascinating backdrop to then think about how we bring uh, change into that notion. There's this acronym in the change space, right? Uh, T T W W A D I. T T W W A D I. That's the acronym. I often will ask people if they ever heard, have heard of it, and I tell them you've experienced it, even if you don't know what the acronym means. It stands for that's the way we've always done it. T T W A D I. That's the way we've always done it. But then I think about that against this backdrop of what have we done over the last three years that we would have told you was impossible before that. And it's kind of an interesting check on inertia, right? If that's the way we've always done it, gives us this forward momentum, but then we did a bunch of impossible things in response to a pandemic. I do think you're, I think organizations are a settling back into that inertia of doing things the way we've always done. My hope is that we're able to bring forward that capability of adaptability, the earned resilience, um, the, the challenge in why things are done because of, uh, I don't know, I, I hope that's part of what we bring out of this pandemic is a sense of continued curiosity uh, at why things happen, how they happen. Indeed, it does. Now, Let's do a, a little bit of a mental exercise. So you get a magic wand and you become the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Okay. So now forget about advising these Fortune 500s. You are the, the CEO of these Fortune 500s. What are the questions you will ask on your first day? And what could be the first actions that you would do in the first 90 days that you are in, in that position? So I very much appreciate the question. Uh, and one of the reasons is, you know, my, uh, Ancora Imparo became a bit of a motto I grabbed onto in 2020, right? Allegedly Michelangelo's last words loosely translate into yet I am still learning. 
Uh, and that was a mentality that I took on in 2020, that if these one of the smartest beings on the planet ever decided on his way out that he was still learning, then each of us can take on a, a mentality of continuing to learn. And so I love that you framed up the question as what questions would I ask as I stepped into this organization to learn? Because to me, that's what it's all about is what is the learning I can do at the beginning mm -hmm. to understand what I'm setting into. So here's my first question I would set up for them. Uh, I would say, it's kind of a two-part question. Tell me about, tell me the story of the last five changes that really succeeded and helped us move forward. And then tell me the story about the last five changes that come to mind that really missed, failed to deliver objectives, failed to create the change we had hoped for when we invested time and energy about them. And then, so first I would just have them, you know, get these stories flowing. And then what patterns do we notice across those that worked well and those that didn't work well? So to me, that's to get the organization start to really to, to reflect on these journeys that they've had. Also, with my lens of knowing about those variables of change success, right? We talked about those seven most seven top contributors as variables to change success. I would be listening with an ear toward what's the level of sponsorship capability? What's the level of communication capability? How effectively are we engaging our people managers? What about our front line? Are we using structured change approaches? Are we using dedicated resources? And are we integrating the technical and people sides? So I'm doing almost a best practice audit in my head as I'm hearing me them tell me these stories of the changes that worked and didn't. Uh, because that gives me then the landscape of where can I start to build capability to enhance and, and drive change forward in the organization. Then, so that'd be kind of my, my first bit of my answer. My second bit, and this would, I would go around individually and engage um, senior leaders by title and senior leaders by influence, because they are not always the same, right? In, indeed. Indeed. And so certainly the ones on the org chart, but I would lean into some sort of network analysis to figure out where is the influence, where are the information nodes. And as I'm talking to each of these people, I would ask them, these, these are the three questions I kind of pulled together. What is our purpose as an organization? What is our purpose as an organization? Who do we serve? And how do we create value? Hmm. What's our purpose? Who do we serve? How do we create value? But I'm not going to do that as a big group. I'm going one by one through these senior leaders and it's by, by title and by influence to start to gain. And what I'm doing, trying to do there is make sense of the degree of shared, what sort of alignment do we have in an organization around what I'd consider those most critical pillars and most important things for us to align around as we go forward. So... <laughs> Tim, I, I really like your answers because I thought about my, that question myself and because of your answer, I'm changing my views on a certain... Ah, really? Thing. How, how so? <laughs> yes, I I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought about spe specifically about the, the, the area of, of going by leaders, by influence and, and by title. Uh, I find it quite powerful. I mean, it looks... Maybe it's something that I thought once upon a time in terms of talking to people by inf <clears throat> in, in terms of level of influence, but never to answer that type of question. And that it, it is quite powerful, Tim. <laughs> Thank you very much for for reshaping a little bit the way I think, Tim. So if Thank you very much for making the time for uh, for this episode of Growth Hacking Culture, uh, this podcast. Um, and I wanted to to ask you. So if people want to ask you questions, where do they go? LinkedIn, your website? Tell me a little bit more. Yeah, if people want to come find us, uh, the first place to start would be the ProSci website itself, prosci.com. There are loads of thought leadership articles, blogs. Uh, there's 
whole host of live webinars, on-demand webinars. Uh, we actually did one just yesterday, releasing this newest round of research. Um, so you can go watch those there. Uh, if you're looking for short snippets, um, the ProSci YouTube channel yeah. has some really nice little snippets, including a whole series of what we call Tim Talks where it's people asking me a handful of questions. They're each about four or five minutes long, but they really explore some of these key foundational questions about more successful change. And then I am by far the most active personally on LinkedIn. So if you track me down on LinkedIn, that's where you get what I'm thinking about each day. Uh, sometimes at night you get the bourbon inspired uh, posts, which are <laughs> even a little that. more fun sometimes, so. Tim, I will put all these links uh, below this episode. Thank you very much for your time. And it was really lovely and insightful. I, I, I wasn't expecting that I'm, I was going to take so many notes for myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Have an excellent day. It was my pleasure. Thank you.